Hi, thanks all for having me be here. I'm very aware that um, I'm not a horticulturalist, but somehow I've gotten involved in, in growing trees. And I'm also aware that I'm giving a presentation to a bunch of pawpaw growers about how to um, grow pawpaw trees. Um, <laughs> so hopefully there's something in here that uh, you'll take away that, that's useful. It comes from uh, going on for five years of experience now, setting up um, some growing trials in both orchard settings and wild pawpaw stands that relates back to about uh, 2018 when we first established um, the uh, replicated experimental orchards here at Waterman Farm that you'll see later and also at OSU Piketon uh, in uh, South Centres and um, a lot of that early work was done with Brad. Brad, you should give a wave. It's like it was, it was Brad and I who kind of uh, first started these, these kinds of things. So, and Brad really led on creating these orchards, so I'm very grateful to him. Um, so, yeah, we'll try to give you some insights into the ways in which we've been approaching establishing trees in these, in these rather different conditions, some of the challenges we've had, and some of the variation in performance that we've seen um, in, in the different settings, both in terms of growth and survival and stress. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll also be able to give you some of our information on um, productivity in some of the wild stands that we've been monitoring for um, six or seven years now, actually. Um, we don't have any productivity data yet for um, our pawpaw orchards. As you know, they um, take a pretty long time to come into production. We just had our first really good year of flowering this year until all those leaf frosts came along oh. and we ended up with about three flowers. So next year, right? Always next year with pawpaws. It's always next year. Um, before I start, I do want to acknowledge a huge bunch of people that have helped with this work um, over the years, including our funders. We've had lots of great funding from uh, ODA, um, from the USDA, and from uh, NC SER, as well as wonderful support from um, the OPGA, uh, really dating back to when we first started this work. Um, huge bunch of organizations and companies have kind of uh, supported us in kind or with our uh, providing letters for our research proposals. And then in smaller text there is all the various students and helpers and friends that have helped with a lot of the field work that you're going to see. Right at the end there is my uh, very special data collection system <laughs> that helped with um, some of the, the woodland survival collection. So if any of the data is wrong, it's because I couldn't read this handwriting. <laughs> okay, uh, so a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we'll talk a little bit to begin with about uh, tree establishment experiences in orchard settings and woodland patches and then we'll talk a little bit about that uh, woodland pawpaw production. Sarah's probably sitting there uh, rolling her eyes because a lot of the work I'm going to uh, present, the, the real work, I just sit in my office and answer emails and analyse data. A lot of the real work was done by uh, Sarah, I'm seeing her, like, co -author and PhD student, who's been so instrumental in a lot of this. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about controls on yield, we'll talk a little bit about variation in fruit quality in wild stands specifically, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the ways in our latest research project we're looking to intervene in the management of wild stands to improve our outcomes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about tree establishment and we'll focus on our experimental orchards. First of all, so you all know what an orchard looks like. Um, maybe ours looks a little bit different to yours, but this is uh, kind of in about year two. When you go out there to have a look later, you'll see that they, they've really matured on nicely. Um, so these orchards were established, as I said, with input from, from Brad here at Waterman Farm and down in Piketon, those, those two sites I showed you previously. Um, and when we established these, we were interested in a number of things. We were interested in getting a sense of variation in um, growth and performance and maturation of different, a bunch of different varieties. We are interested in creating opportunities to look at establishment of both uh, you know, purchased ready grafted trees, uh, as well as you know, uh, planting out seedlings that we could then graft ourselves later on. And we were interested to see how variation in management intensity and kind of economic input, both at the start and throughout the um, ongoing development of the orchard, affected uh, survival, growth, um, establishment and, and then later on fruit, fruiting success and, and fruit quality. Um, so the, the plan we came up with really, we, we're going to talk about two different input systems, a high and a low input. So our orchard has about, um, when it was initially planted, had a, I think that's it, I forget the number now, uh, 15 different varieties, right? We're now up to heading towards 30. Um, so 
So there's a whole, so there's a whole bunch of seedling trees there, which we, which we subsequently grafted onto. So we have 15 different varieties replicated five times across um, these, these high and low input treatments. So the high input treatment is what you're seeing here, uh, and that consisted of uh, you know, tilling to create a, a raised mound, which was then covered in, in landscape fabric, and we planted through the landscape fabric, and there's drip irrigation lines. Uh, running through that as well. So we've got that irrigation that we can turn on and that will actually allow us to fertigate the trees in the future once they're established and beginning to, uh, to fruit as well. On our low input side, we basically gave them hell. We just planted them in the ground and left them. They had nothing except a little bit of weed control uh, uh, around them every, every year or so. Um, so, you know, there's big economic differences in, in a number of these things, you know, for the, well, back at that time, for grafted trees, you were talking about $30 a tree, it's, it's more than that now, um, you know, it's heading towards $40, $50 for some, for some varieties now, for larger ones, and obviously there's the, the cost of, you know, setting up the irrigation system, having, you need a pump, you need a well, you need the, you know, the main lines and the drip lines, there's a, there's a lot of cost involved in that, so we really wanted to see whether that was going to give us benefits and allow us to get to production quicker. Okay, so the overall headline numbers for, for survival looks something like this. Um, so we had uh, these different stock types, so seedling trees which came be uh, bare root from uh, Indiana nursery, uh, state nursery. We had uh, grafted bare root trees and we had grafted trees uh, that came in pots. So three different stock types. Um, what you can see there is that consistently we were seeing the highest survival in the high input system where we were um, you know, uh, providing them with irrigation, um, you know, helping retain moisture in the soil through, and suppressing weeds through the, through the landscape, uh, landscape fabric. Uh, we were also seeing that the best survival was from the, from the seedling trees. Um, so there wasn't so much of a difference between uh, the, the, the stock types, seedling trees were bare roots, but Grafted container stock trees did okay, the grafted bare root trees are not so great, particularly in the low input system. So that additional, there's, there's multiple sources of stress there, right? The trees are bare roots, so they've got stress on their roots, they've also got a graft that's trying to uh, establish and survive, so there's limited, you know, multiple stresses on transport of water and nutrients through the plant. You can see I'm not a horticulturist. So high input systems seem to work uh, pretty well. Uh, and, and the seedling trees generally showed the highest establishment, even though they were bare roots. What was interesting, though, is if we begin to break that down a little bit by year and by site, uh, we start to see some interesting patterns emerge. The survival at Columbus, at the Waterman Farm Orchard, was by and large much greater than we were tending to see at, at Piketon. So we've got some interesting site-related uh, differences there. Remember, these orchards are pretty much exactly replicated at the two sites, it's all the same varieties, the same input systems, pretty much the same um, irrigation schedule, and that's controlled by precipitation. Um, but you know, we're starting to see some, some differences there. Uh, survival in 2019, my first year survival was obviously a little bit lower. Um, we got a lot of mortality in that first year, and by the second year, most things are beginning to survive. But you can see there that, that Columbus really is doing uh, a lot better than, than Piketon. Um, whether or not the grafts versus the grafted trees versus the seedling trees also seem to differ a little bit by, by site. At, at Piketon, in the high input system, the grafted trees were doing a little bit better than the seedling trees. So what happens can be a little bit site specific. So we were interested in, in digging into that a little bit more and seeing um, what else was going on. So over the next few years, we've been able to track the growth, not just the survival of the trees, but also their growth. Um, growth is important, right? We need to get those trees big and mature and beginning to flower as quickly as we can so we can begin to produce fruit. Um, here you'll see just uh, variation, these boxes are just showing like variation and the average, uh, that's that thick solid line, uh, average relative growth uh, in the high input and the low input systems. And what we we're generally seeing is that um, in the high input systems, the, the seedling trees, the container stock, stock trees, um, were, were growing better than the, the bare root plants. In the low input system, um, things were all kind of uh, struggling, well, not struggling, but, but growing less at least over the, over the first couple of years. Um, you'll see that there's some trees there that just shown in terms of relative growth because obviously they all start off at, at different sizes. You'll see some trees there have negative relative growth, which seems weird. That would be situations where 
the kind of top part of the tree actually died back because it was stressed and then it would begin to re-sprout from the growth. So it would actually shrink from, from one year to the next initially. So we, we saw a lot more of that kind of like top die back and re-sprouting in the low input system again, another sign that the trees were a bit stressed in that situation. Um, so to try to get to the bottom of some of this, we've been doing a, a little bit of kind of plant uh, physiological work, as shown in these two photos there. So on the left, uh, you can see Sarah measuring uh, leaf water potential with a pressure chamber, so we can take the leaves off the trees, we put them into this pressure chamber, introduce nitrogen gas into this chamber, basically it squeezes the leaf until it squeezes water out through the little petiole, and we can record how much pressure we have to apply before the water starts getting squeezed out. The more pressure you have to apply, the less water there is in the leaf, the more stressed the plant is. And then on the right uh, is Rachel, who's measuring um, chlorophyll fluorescence, which is a measure of uh, photosynthetic activity, um, an indicator of photosynthetic activity in the leaf. It tells us about uh, how much chlorophyll there is in there and how, um, how healthy the plant is overall. Uh, we also measured something called stomatal conductance. So you probably all know that like leaves have those little stomata through which gas is exchanged, CO2 comes in, oxygen goes out when they've got their stomata open to bring in CO2 to be able to photosynthesize and grow, they can also lose moisture. So when plants are stressed, they'll close up their stomata uh, to prevent moisture loss. So we can measure the amount of water that's coming out of the plants, which tells us how open or closed those stomata are and how stressed, again, how stressed the plants they are. All of these measurements are super noisy. So here's some results from stomatal conductance, which looks like a big mess. All those little dots are individual measurements of individual leaves on lots of different trees. Generally, what you need to understand is that lower values means less conductance, means, uh, means higher stress, because the stomata are closed up, there's less water being conducted out of them. Um, and what we're seeing there is that, in the low, although it's very noisy, in the low input system, generally the plants are showing Higher, um, higher moisture stress. Um, again, that was, in, that was for 2019, kind of the first year plants were growing. We made measurements again in 2021 after they were a little bit more established. Again, here we're comparing the high and low inputs. Uh, blue is Piketon, green is Waterman Farm. So interestingly, again, we're seeing some site-related differences. The plants seem a little bit more stressed at Piketon for some reason, but there's lower stomatal conductance values. Lower values means more stress, and, uh, but not really any difference between the treatments there. At Waterman Farm, um, we're seeing some differences between the high and low inputs in terms of stress, but generally they seem to be a little bit more active uh, than, than down at Piketon. Um, we can look at leaf water potential as well, remember that squeezing of the leaves. We can see pretty much the same um, pattern. Um, uh, Interestingly, not really any significant differences in, uh, in leaf water potential at, at Waterman, which suggests that despite the fact that they were seeing these differences in, in stomatal conductance, they were still um, maintaining their, their, their leaf water potential. Um, again, at Piketon, a little bit of a difference between the high and the low input systems there. Um, now finally, to try to understand all this a little bit more, we were also able to measure soil moisture content. Now this is where it gets really interesting, right? Because we saw that, that high stress down at Piketon, so we should, you know, it would be reasonable to think, well that's probably because the soils are drier down at Piketon, there's less moisture available for the trees. Well, actually we found the opposite, that soils were generally wetter down at Piketon, um, and there's not really any difference between the high and the low uh, input systems. So that's, that's, that's curious. Um, you can have soil conditions that are too wet for trees, which can also create stressful situations. At Waterman Farm, those differences we were seeing between the treatments seem to make sense in the high input system where there's irrigation and shade fab uh, landscape fabric down, um, much higher soil moisture content, um, much more moisture available for the trees in the high input system there, again, reducing stress. Okay. So that's um, what we've learned from, from, uh, from our orchard settings, that we can alleviate stress during the initial establishment and planting phase by uh, us utilizing irrigation, using that, that mounded technique, ensuring we're covering the ground. We use plastic mulch, landscape fabric, you could also use you know, just wood chip mulch, whatever you want, to try to uh, suppress competition and to retain, uh, to retain moisture. But there do seem to be these interesting site-related differences that we need to understand a little bit more. Okay, 
So in addition to planting trees in, um, uh, in, in orchards, we've also been really interested in trying to understand pawpaw production in woodland settings. Currently, still probably the majority of our fruit are coming from, from woodlands and it's very variable in its quality and very variable, variable in uh, productivity both from year to year and location to location. Um, one thing that we're interested to do through our SARE project is to look at ways in which we can utilise pawpaw production not just to produce a pawpaw crop but also as a way to incentivise like, wider forest management. We have a lot of forest health management issues in Ohio including invasive species coming in like honeysuckle or like um, multiflora rose but it's expensive to intervene and do the restoration that's going to promote the health of our oak hickory forest. Some of the things that we think we need to do for producing pawpaws in forests like clearing the understory and increasing light availability also should have wider benefits uh, for forest health but to do that we need to know how to best establish trees in these, in these woodland settings, best establish new pawpaw plots. So that's what we're doing through our <coughs> NC SARE project, or part of what we're doing through our NC SARE project, um, is to look at the effects of, kind of competition, invasive species control on, on tree establishment, as well as kind of best practice approaches in the forest. So we've been doing this work at this site here uh, called uh, Pomerine Forest Laboratory, which is near Coshocton, Ohio. Um, the site is uh, an, an experimental forest owned by OSU, but it's also a hotbed of invasive species. You name it, we've got it there. It's uh, in pretty poor condition. Um, we've got uh, big problems with oriental bittersweet and multiflora rose, and also privet, strangely enough. It's hugely problematic there. So some of the plots that we've been looking at look like this. that kind of forest gaps where there's been historic harvesting, um, but they're just kind of completely encroached in the understory by, by invasive species. So we've been clearing those areas out, and you can see the results of that. This is the same plot before and after we cleared out the invasive species from the understory. This is a plot that colloquially known to us as dead deer, because there was a dead deer in the <laughs> hanging on a tree. Um, and so after, the, uh, after, the, after we cleared, we've been planting trees out there. Um, a couple of different techniques we've been using. Um, Mostly we've been planting seedling trees into each of these plots. We planted 30 seedling trees, either with or without tree guards because of concern about deer browsing pressure. And we also planted uh, three grafted varietal trees. Um, so, you know, there's cost involved. This is again that sort of high, low input. We can just put the trees out there, just plant them. Um, our hypothesis was they, they should be okay. There's actually quite a lot of research showing that deer tend to avoid pawpaw. Um, there's no pawpaw, this is the, the pawpaw. There's no pawpaw trees at all at Pomerine Forest, as far as we, we know. It's kind of interesting from that point of view. So it's a good site to like look at introducing pawpaw. Um, but uh, what we found, um, so you know, is that these these tree guards that they may or may not have a benefit, but they're, they're hugely expensive. They're actually more expensive than the trees themselves. So they've got, it's got to be worthwhile to invest in putting those tree guards up. Um, so we planted in a variety of conditions, including at the forest edge, we've got this kind of gradient of light availability. And we've also been doing some other things kind of on the side, we've established some polycultures of um, either black walnut and uh, with a pawpaw interplanting, or uh, chestnut with a pawpaw interplanting. And we've also been interplanting some uh, sort of slightly decrepit existing black walnut uh, plantations to look at the performance of the under black walnut. It's very early days for this, we only planted the trees last year, but we can tell you some of the things we found, uh, at least by last end of last summer, the seedling survival was really pretty good. We had about 98% survival by the end of the first growing season. The grafted varieties, however, did absolutely terrible, yeah. which is interesting. You might remember from the orchard plantings, actually our container stock grafted varieties, they did really pretty well. This is the same supplier, same material, did shocking in the woods. Um, some of that was due to the fact that as soon as we planted them, raccoons would come along and dig them back up. <laughs> and we'd come back the next day and they'd just be sort of scattered and chewed uh, across the forest, which is a little bit depressing, but we saw a lot of mortality as well, even for the ones that the raccoons didn't get. Um, there is a lot of evidence of stress though. So, interestingly, for a tree that's not supposed to be targeted by deer, they seem to absolutely love our pawpaw seedlings. Um, so two thirds of them were um, pretty, uh, showing um, signs of some, some sort of browsing, so we have lots of invertebrate browsing and defoliation, um, and two-thirds of them was, were looking like 
uh, pretty stressed. So they were, you know, it, it's a more, much more difficult environment out in the woods for these trees than when we're babying them in, in the orchards. Um, many of the trees uh, showed signs of deer browsing pressure. 25% um, of our unguarded trees were browsed, but 18% of the, the guarded trees were uh, also got browsed when they were sticking out the top. So the deer were going at them, even though they're supposed to avoid them. So maybe our local populations of deer are kind of like naive to just how distasteful uh, poor poor are. I mean, that is the thing. Like, you know, populations can be naive. Uh, the other interesting thing that happened is the deer really didn't like our tree guards. I mean, they strongly objected to them. So if you're interested in wildlife science, there's this whole like, line of research on how wildlife interacts with like, novel objects in the landscape. This is a good example of that. And they're like, no, nah, we don't like this. And uh, they pretty much went through every plot and all of the orchards. And we were like, no. Uh, so we've gone back in there and kind of more heavily engineered our deer protection. Even, even though they got blatted down, a lot of the trees got damaged, but they, they do seem to still mostly be alive, which is like a relief. Because uh, turning up to find that was, uh, was pretty depressing. Um, so it does look like um, tree guards, if they're properly, um, appropriately utilized, uh, will provide some initial protection from deer browsing, particularly at sites where um, Deer may be naive to avoiding uh, pawpaw, so it'd be interesting to compare this at sites where there's existing pawpaw and see if we still get that avoidance. Um, and we'll be following through this and looking at some of the stuff to do with stress and growth um, and wider performance over the next couple of years as this project matures. Okay, so that's our stuff on um, uh, uh, tree stress and tree growth in these two different settings. We can also talk a little bit about uh, woodland production of pawpaw. And this we've been doing at um, five different sites, including the Wetlands and Waterman Farm here in Columbus, um, down at OSU Python, and up with two collaborating growers at Foxpool Farm, owned by Ron Powell, and Integration Acres, owned by Chris Schmiel. So we're very grateful to both of them for allowing us to come and uh, monitor existing pawpaw patches on, that, on their property. Uh, so we've been tracking um, production at uh, two or more of these sites as, as far back as 2015 um, and uh, the first thing we noticed like there's a lot of variability from, from year to year including two bumpy years at Integration Acres when we first started monitoring there in 2016 and 2017 which is an overwhelming amount of fruit. Uh, more recently uh, the numbers tend to be more similar to what we're seeing at other sites. So if we just remove Integration Acres which is showing off in 2016 and 2017 what we can uh, more clearly see is this kind of this, this fluctuation from, from year to year. And so those of you who are kind of you know, familiar with, with fruit growing may know that if in, you know, in other orchards, in other fruit growing situations, things like apples, they can show this pattern of biennial bearing. They'll invest heavily in um, reproduction and fruit production one year and then less so the next. And we're sort of starting to see some, I mean, we need much longer term data, but we're starting to see some hints of maybe there's this pattern of kind of biennial bearing, but to really dig into this a little bit more, we're going to have to factor in like, you know, effects of like late frosts and things like that, which control, control flower numbers, uh, variation in weather conditions from year to year as well. Uh, we're seeing this big fluctuation, some sites much more productive than others. So even here, again, it's interesting to see Foxpool Farm. Um, I'm sure you can see my cursor. Um, is there a laser pointer on here? Um, Foxball Farm is the one at the top there in kind of uh, yellow. Uh, again, that's showing much higher production than some of the other sites, much more consistent. Um, that's because um, Ron has been doing some management of some of those wild patches already, so particularly like control, opening up the um, overstory a little bit, uh, in, uh, increasing light availability. Um, so we've been able to take this data and do some fancy um, statistics to try to predict the probability of these trees producing fruit because the, the reality is many of the trees we monitor actually don't produce any fruit in any one given year um, but uh, we can try to figure out what's controlling the probability of a tree producing any fruit at all in, the, in these woodland settings um, so what you hit, see here is that the results of that model basically what we see here is that first of all there's this kind of exponential relationship between the size of the tree and the probability of producing fruit but also it varies a lot between whether the canopy is relatively open and there's quite a lot of light so in that kind of like woodland opening forest gap situation or at the forest edge versus whether you're under a closed canopy 
So in blue there, those, plot, those are plots that are closed canopy plots. In red is plots that are open canopy. So if you look at this data like this, if you have a, if you want to get an 80% chance of producing a fruit on a tree, in a closed canopy situation, on average, you need to get to a tree diameter of about three inches. But in an open canopy situation, much younger, much smaller trees have the same probability of producing fruit. Right? So, you know, the energetic resource, the level of maturity that's needed before they start producing is much less, where light availability is greater. And Sarah's doing a lot of work um, through, through her PhD to, uh, to dig into some of this a little bit more monitor like conditions. So, tree size, unsurprisingly, increases the probability of getting a fruit, but canopy openness and light availability is the number one thing we think controlling. Uh, fruit production. If we look at it in terms of the actual predicted number of fruit the trees produced, again, we, from our models we show the same thing, from our analysis we show the same thing, so in closed canopies, in red there, um, look how, you know, as the trees change in size, there's really rather little difference in the number of fruit produced, very few fruit produce, being produced, kind of less than 20, irrespective of the size of the tree, whereas in those open conditions, as the trees get bigger, the amount of production might like, really begins to, to take off quite a lot as the trees mature. So again, tree size increases the number of fruit you get, but so too does light availability. Absolutely critical. Uh, so the big question we've been asking ourselves is, okay, well, how much light do you actually need? Because obviously it no longer becomes woodland pawpaw production if you cut down your woodland <laughs> to increase light production uh, to, to, get, to increase your fruit production. So how much light is enough light? And so again, through our NC SAR project, what we've been doing is uh, creating some uh, shade uh, structures at, at two of our growers' um, orchards, so we can actually apply controlled amounts of shade to existing mature trees and leave, leave these shade shelters up for a, a number of, of years. Um, they have either 20%, 50%, or 80% uh, shade cloth on them. Um, and we're going to track the number of fruit and the amount of flowering of these trees over time. Um, last year we didn't really collect any data because a lot of the fruit production is kind of hardwired in from the energetic resources that were available to the tree the previous year. So we weren't really expecting to see much in the way of an impact in the first year of having these uh, tree sh shelters on, but this year is going to be super interesting because they've now had like They'll have you know, two full growing seasons of being under these increased amounts of shade, and we can begin to see whether it's affecting um, fruit production on, on these trees. One really interesting finding, I think I'm about to stop that, I'm about to stop that. Um, <laughs> is that uh, what we did seem to find that's super interesting from a production point of view, not just in woodlands but also in, in orchards, is that uh, applying this shade cloth seem to delay the ripening of the fruit. So particularly where we applied the 80% shade cloth, the fruit ripened much, much later than the trees in full sun. So you all know, if you're poor poor producers, that one of the problems, right, is we have that really pretty short window of fruit availability. They already, if you go out to like Washington and Oregon and look at some of those high intensity apple orchards, they already do this. They're growing them under shade cloth to reduce stress, but also to like prolong the ripening process. This seems to work for, for poor poor and it opens up some really interesting possibilities of in production systems, growing things under shade, under hoop houses and, and shade, under shade cloth uh, to try to extend that window when fresh fruit is available. So we'd really like to follow up on, on this. Um, there's other things that we know going on in woodlands as well, uh, including like weird pollination syndromes, including variation in the number of pistols that flowers seem to have, uh, depending whether they're commercial varietals or wild trees. Um, so we're doing a lot of work on flower morphology, and Anne, if Anne is here, somewhere, Anne Shannon, is uh, with Sarah doing some work on, on pollination uh, effects, because we, we believe that maybe pollination limitation and self unfruitfulness in woodland settings might be important. A lot of our patches, a lot of our wild patches, are actually clonal. Not necessarily fully clonal, although some of them are. We know that pawpaw spread by those underground root suckers. Sometimes you can come to a patch in a woodland, it might all actually be the same organism. And can't, or current belief is that it can't pollinate itself as, as effectively. So we're trying to look into that experimentally by doing pollen exchange um, experiments and trying to understand the pollination process a little bit more. Hopefully, 
we come back next year or the year after, we'll have some information for that to share on that with you all. Uh, this is based on some early work that uh, Libby, Liberty Brigner did, um, who's here doing some, uh, some hand pollination experiments back in 2015. I should, I should actually say that as far as, I know you all have probably been involved in poor poor for years, but on the OSU side, the reason why all of us are here today is because of uh, Libby Brigner, an undergraduate student who, when I was brand shiny new faculty member, came and spoke to me and said that she wanted to work on pawpaw and I just arrived from the UK and I didn't even know what pawpaw tree was. <laughs> so, all this is Libby's fault, right? Uh, okay, uh, woodland fruit quality, just to wrap up. So, um, obviously we're interested not just in producing lots of fruit, we're also interested in producing good fruit. And we know that we face challenges in, uh, in many of our production systems with problems like phyllosticta or the pawpaw peduncle borer or misshapen fruit or variation in the number of the amount of seeds of our fruit in the wild can just be full of seeds and not much flesh or have poor flavour profiles. Um, so again Sarah a few years ago did some work to try to characterise variation in fruit quality um, from wild collected fruit. Um, is it worth investing and in doing things in our woodlands? Uh, to grow these, these higher quality commercial varietals. Okay, so there's a number of quality, I mean really I'm speaking to things that Joe Shearer and should be talking about because he's our fruit quality expert, so forgive me Joe. Uh, fruit quality is kind of a nebulous concept, right? It can include the size of the fruit, the flavour profile, the chemistry, all sorts of things, but here's a number of, uh, a number of different aspects we can look at. First of all, in terms of size, we all want big fruit, right? Um, what we've divided up here is just a histogram showing the number of fruits is collected across five different sites, um, several hundred fruit that were characterized from multiple different plots and multiple different sites. Um, what, we, what we're going to look at this in terms of is uh, in terms of uh, good, bad, good average or bad quality according to the um, poor poor um, evaluation chart that was produced by uh, Neil Peterson back in the, in the 1980s. So it's kind of a crude way of looking at it, but it, it's, it's kind of useful. Um, so what we see here is that in terms of uh, fruit size, most things are falling on that kind of left hand side. We get a lot of very small bad fruit, a lot of average fruit, and rather few kind of big fruit falling into that good size quality. Pawpaw fruit from the wild are distinctly average overall, we, it's fair to say. So here we looked at kind of the appearance profile, the flavour profile, aroma and fleshiness, which is that, that kind of flesh to seed ratio in the fruit. Most of our fruits are falling in that average um, category, uh, whereas many of our kind of commercial varietals are going to be hitting those, those, kind of, those good conditions. Um, interestingly, for wild correct, collected fruit, relatively few of them were showing signs of like cracking or um, phyllosticta. So we think those, those uh, issues might be less in, in woodlands. And the, the small percentage there that had the kind of black spots of bias actually mostly came from, from one site. Um, many others of them had like what we call peculiarities, so they were like weird shapes, um, things like that that may not, may not be easily marketable. Um, so overall, you know, we're not getting great quality fruit out of woodlands, even where we can get large amounts. Um, so there are ways that we can maybe intervene in these woodlands to try to improve both production and quality. And uh, Sarah's going to talk to you a lot about uh, quality improvement experiments and, and some of the ways of post-processing that might be relevant to kind of thinking about quality as well. And she's doing a huge amount of work on this for her PhD, doing ways to like effectively harvest fruit and looking at fruit quality overall. Um, so how can we go about enhancing production in these woodland settings? Well, the number one thing we believe is to increase light availability. Uh, there's some interesting win-wins here, so uh, integration acres, give Chris, he's sitting over there. Um, you know, there can be benefits to this, even where there's not invasive species. So one of Chris's sites had a lot of competition from um, spice bush that we were able to clear, and then Chris can then utilize for, uh, for spice bush tea, so we can clear these sites. Uh, to in, uh, increase light availability for our pawpaw. Um, it's going to hopefully increase the number of fruit we produce. We're also looking at, as, as you saw previously, in-planting uh, varietals, which hasn't gone so well so far, but we're also looking at grafting in varietals as well. So Sarah's been doing some work grafting in commercial varieties to enhance the genetic variability in these patches. 
which hopefully will improve uh, pollination success, if indeed there is pollination in these kind of uh, you know, um, genetically uniform patches, uh, but also introduce some varieties that are going to produce those good quality fruits as opposed to the rather mediocre things that we get off of many of our trees at the moment. Again, we're on this at pretty early stages, but uh, stay tuned because we hope in another few growing seasons we'll be able to uh, show the, the benefits or otherwise of some of these interventions. Okay, so just to wrap up here, in conclusion, so we're talking about woodlands. Production from our woodland patches, number one thing is that we uh, are going to have to manage and intervene if we really want to get a high quality uh, fruit and um, you know, commercially viable levels of productivity. Light availability is absolutely key. We need to understand where exactly those thresholds are because as I kind of you know, slightly glibly said earlier, we don't want to have to cut down our forest to grow poor poor if our goal is to use poor poor to incentivize uh, sustainable forest management. Uh, we, look, we can look at grafting in a supplemental planting of varietals to produce high quality material. Um, deer pest management, super important. Um, and it's also important to remember that production is going to be super variable from, from year to year. Um, in orchards, they are a good economic alternative, they take a while to come into production, but we believe so far that some of these high input systems that reduce stress uh, are great at increasing survival and growth. So irrigating, using shade cloth, uh, using container stock or grafting in situ seem to be the best approaches uh, for, um, for orchard establishment. Uh, most important thing that probably in orchards, or another important thing is to think carefully about choosing the right variety and range of varieties to obtain the uh, quality and economic outcomes you want. So we, can, we can talk a lot about variation of fruit quality across varieties and we have some ability to make some recommendations on that. I'll leave it there. Um, there's some contact information uh, for the kind of core member of the uh, kind of woodland and orchard side of the team, uh, myself, uh, Sarah and, uh, and Joe, um, as well as uh, links to the OPGA and the um, OSU portal page if you want to. Thanks very much. Thank you.